We'll have um, a talk tonight which is called the, the Business of War. This event is part of a series of talks, events, discussions we have on German-Israeli relations, uh, which are organized not only here in Berlin, but in different places in Germany, and we have different subjects. Uh, it's all organized by our dear friend and colleague, Yossi Bartal, who designed the whole, the, the, the whole series, who organizes this, and he will also be our facilitator, facilitator tonight. Um, the topic tonight is, is, is very important, and that's why we have two very, very prominent and very uh, distinguished uh, speakers here. Uh, let us start with the ladies. Jans, if you allow you, the member of parliament, but let's start with the ladies. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, Shahaf Weisbein from Israel. She is uh, working for a quite new organization called Hamoshim. Uh, she came here the first time in Germany, but she is an expert on disarmament arms, Israeli arms export. And on the other hand, we have Jan van Aken, who is the speaker, the one, the expert of Die Linke for when it comes to disarmament weapons. Arms control, export of arms. He's specializing in, on small firearms, especially, and uh, uh, he has uh, an expert who has an, an, a very deep insight in what's going on on, on, on German arms exports and on arms control. So I would, before I hand over to Yossi to be our facilitator, I would like to make two more organizational remarks. The one is, please sign our attendance list. You know, we are taxpayer funded and the German taxpayer needs to know what we are spending our money on, and an event like this is worth our spending taxpayer money on. The other, th the other thing I would like to mention is that we will record the, the talk tonight, and if some of you would not like to be recorded, not be, uh, that the image is not shown in public, please tell us. Uh, usually we only, we only record the speakers and the facilitators, but if you are hesitant uh, with recording what we are doing, please let us know. So, welcome our speakers, give them a big hand, and I hand over to Yossi. Thank you. So, I'm very happy you all came uh, in this weather. Uh, we also have some nice t-shirts from the Coalition of Women for Peace, uh, or from Hamushim, and some other uh, information uh, from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, uh, from the Israel office uh, over there. If you want to take them, you're more than welcome. There's also something to drink and eat, all for free. Uh, the t-shirts are not for free, so if you want to buy them, talk with Shachaf later. It will go as a donation for, uh, for the project. Um, so we will try to, uh, it's a very big, issue today, uh, the weapon industry or the military industry, it's much bigger than just weapons. Uh, and uh, we will start with you, Shachaf, and we'll ask a little bit about, uh, first of all, introduce your, your organization, what, what exactly are you doing, uh, what's your, not just uh, critique, but what is, what is your actual work? So, my name is Shachaf. And I work for the Coalition of Women for Peace, which is an organization of Palestinian and Jewish women acting against the occupation. And as a part of our analysis and struggle against the Israeli occupation of Palestine, um, we're working on the project called Hamushim. Hamushim is armed in Hebrew. It's a relatively new project. It started almost three years ago as a research program of uh, the Quakers, the American Friends Service Committee. And about two and a half, maybe two years ago, it, they donated the project to us and we're working together on doing research and collecting information regarding the Israeli military industries, which are huge and we'll talk about it. And we're doing a lot of work in terms of making the information accessible and to keeping track of everything that's happening without actual public discussion or supervision. Um, we do public campaigns. Uh, for example, in the event cover photo, you saw uh, an action we did on the issue of selling arms to South Sudan, which Israel is doing. And lately, we had a project against an arms manufacturing and strategic marketing in Israel academically, 
uh, institution called the Technion. It's the number one academic institution, and they had a course on how to market your arms to international markets better. And we had pro uh, protests against it, and we had a letter writing campaign, and a lot of people joined, even within Israel, because it's opened a, a big public discussion, and the course at the moment, we're not sure that it's canceled, but they did not reopen it, and also it, it's not on the website anymore, so it's a success for us. And right now we're uh, working towards having a big actions against the arms expo called ISDEF on the same week that we will be commemorating 50 years of the occupation of uh, 1967 of the occupied territories. There will be a really massive arms expo. It's one of the biggest in the world and it's the biggest in Israel. And we're trying to have both a shadow conference to showcase our civil and feminist notions of security and to present the alternatives and the actual price of what the Israeli arms and military industries are doing. And also we'll have protests and a lot of different actions to try and use what's happening to really bring out a discussion. And this is what we're doing. <laughs> Great. So when we're talking about the military industry, does it work? No. Can I I'll take this. So when we're talking about the uh, military industry, uh, I've, I guess when we speak about military industry in Israel, most people will think, first of all, Uzi, it's a gun or, or something like that. It's actually, what is the size of this industry? What is actually producing and, uh, and how big is it in the Israeli market? Um, in terms of export, um, Israel is one of the top 10 uh, arms exporters in the world, but if you try to look at it in the perspective of the GDP. Um, Israel is the number one weapons export, and we export weapons to 130 countries, which a lot of them are not human rights friendly, and a lot of them are in state of conflicts. Um, the Israeli industry exports in the sum of almost six billion. It's one of the biggest industries in the world. Um, in the country? In, in the country, no? Mm -hmm. and the country and also it's one of the biggest industries within Israel uh, almost 150,000 people work in the military industries that are basically you have the private sector the private uh, companies and you have the semi-governmental but all of it is interlinked and combined with the law enforcement agency with the IDF with the Ministry of Defense who takes a big role in the marketing of what the Israeli military industries are manufacturing um, they have a special unit about it. Um, in terms of the size of, uh, of this economy, uh, well, in most of the world, um, the percentages of the arms um, or the military industries in terms of GDP is about 2%. Germany is 2.2. And Israel is almost 6% uh, of our GDP goes to the military industries. And it's really something that when you are active in the Israeli left or when you're trying to have a public discussions on what's going on with the defense uh, industries or try to criticize aspects of the occupation, the aspects regarding to the military industries are never really discussed uh, and never really questions or having a public discussion uh, about what's going on with them and who do they export to and what's the human price regarding the Palestinian territories and the continuation of war. Yeah, but what do you, uh, uh, what is actually the military, like what do they manufacture? Mm -hmm. huh. Well, the, the Israeli military industry started even before the state of Israel was funded as a self to self-provide for arms. Uh, they did a, a lot, a lot of like re, reusing of British arms before the State of Israel started. And in the 60s and the 70s, there was mostly tanks and uh, the Uzi gun. But after the Yom Kippur War, uh, Israel tried to reuse and to rebrand itself as um, an empire regarding asymmetrical fighting, a fighting of uh, constructed, organized military against civilian uh, population, mostly Muslim, and it started working in this issue and part of that was trying to export what, it, what we manufacture to a lot of countries at conflict. For example, Argentina, uh, Chile, 
it was in the 90s, in, we sold to Serbia, and even before Srebrenica. And we still sell today to a lot of countries that use the weapons that we produce and the technologies that we produce and test on Palestinians and to, to really fight against their own opposition or political um, minorities. And what kind of, uh, so what mechanisms are there in Israel to, like the government needs to approve, I guess, the, the southern of weapons. So what, what is exactly the mechanisms to, uh, who, who, like in Germany, does usually the parliament, what, what is it in Israel? Well, in Israel, starting 2007, uh, there is a committee within the Ministry of Defense who's in charge of the defense export. And there is no parliamentary di uh, discussion about what we sell to where. It's all in the hands of the Ministry of Defense, and there's no human rights uh, consideration. They do consider and they do supervise Israel's interest in the arms export, and a lot of the time the U.S. interest in the arms export, uh, but there is no really regard to human rights, and actually the state control reports keep mentioning the unit within the Ministry of Defense um, for not doing its job in trying to fight corruption and due diligence, and also it blames them for not having the sufficient manpower to have any type of effective supervision on who gets um, licenses to sell. We're talking about 400,000 li 400, licenses uh, of selling and 6,000 sellers. And it's quite a massive industry and they only have, or at least they did in 2015, only three employees in charge of actual supervision on this a mass export of weapons because Although the Israeli, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of Israeli companies who manufacture weapons and technologies. Israel is a high-tech nation, and when we say high-tech, we mostly mean security technologies that are being sold. And although there is a lot of companies who work on it, there's still not enough actions and to supervise it and to really keep track of who's saying to what. Even within the licenses, uh, they do not include uh, deals of coordination uh, between different companies. Uh, they do not include a lot of the high-tech technologies that are not considered security expert. And you, you mentioned corruption, and I think uh, the German audience usually uh, probably heard in the last year about this, uh, this one of the four uh, legal uh, cases against Netanyahu, which has now been controlled by the, by the police, is, uh, is the question of actually the selling of German uh, ships to, to the Israeli marine, uh, where there is a big suspicion of corruption. But actually, uh, as you said also before, like, there's a lot of other cases of like, how, how does it actually work like, politically in the, like, how much the politicians enjoy from this economy? Well, what happens is that the IDF attracts certain populations into intelligence work and attracts marginalized communities to do the dirty work. And from the IDF, from being uh, high-ranking officials, usually what happens is that people move into the private sectors and move into the private companies, leaving an entire industry being tracked just like the military is tracked, meaning that most of the security industry in Israel is men, is white men, Ashkenazi men, who do, uh, who profit from this mass industry. And in terms of corruption, a lot of the time the people who are working in the private sector are still serving in the army, whether it's in reserve, surgery, uh, reserve positions, coming back for a month every year or for a few days doing works for the military, while still working on private companies who sell weapons to the IDF and sell weapons to uh, law enforcement agencies. And a lot of time it goes to a place where they reach public, uh, they go back from the public sector into, in, from the private sector into the public sector, working for the Ministry of Defense uh, or being part of the Israeli parliament. We had a few really famous deals and stories about politicians who got involved in corruption deals or trying to privatize a company while they're in office so they can buy it when they're not in office. It happened with Ehud Barak, who was our prime minister. And a lot of those different stories happened with Gal Hirsch. And 
there is really no cooling period and, or any type of separation between people who work for the IDF and people who work for the Israel police or security offices and the people who make the decisions regarding them. Uh, it could be a possibility that people who work for the Ministry of Defense try to, lead, uh, to coordinate deals and, and have agreements with countries that regarding weapons while their best friend or they themselves work for the company who's going to produce or export those weapons or technologies and all that. Mm -hmm. And there was there's a big case with the, it's called the Tasia Avirit, the Israeli Aerospace Industries. They're being investigation right now uh, for having their union members all become part of the Likud party. And one of the sons uh, of uh, the Minister of Welfare, who's from the Likud party, is under investigation, I think is in a house arrest uh, at the moment, trying to reveal how the, this big, massive industry pushed employees to sign into the Likud party. And the Likud party is the party uh, that Netanyahu is approving deals that he's giving to the, this company that they work for, the Israeli uh, aerospace industries. So it's all really tangled up and there's no actual separation between who's working for the military and who's working for the military industries and who's in the army or who's not in the army. It's all part of the, largest, uh, the larger militarization of the Israeli company where you cannot really differentiate who's benefiting from war, who's participating in war. Um, it's like part of our, every academic institution in Israel collaborates with military industries. We even had a career fair in Tel Aviv University uh, this week, and Elbit and a lot of other manufacturing companies came and they gave out donuts inside a public campus. <laughs> it's like one of those things that happens, and every time there's um, a new arms deal that needs to be a matter of public discussion, the Israeli media reports it, but reports it in a way that it's marketing uh, the arms itself. Speaking about export, because what's the interesting thing, I think, for your organization is that um, uh, you are a left-wing organization, of course, not very popular nowadays in Israel, uh, and uh, clearly speaks about the occupation, and clearly speaks also about the fact that uh, the occupation is profitable for those weapon manufacturers. Uh, but in the same time, you could actually, or you do approach, and you do have more support when it comes to the idea of export and export spe specifically when it's not close to Israel, but like to very far away countries where you, there's very clear uh, violations of human rights. And I want to ask you, like, how do you, how do you do that? How do you work with people who refuse to, maybe to speak about the occupation, but still show uh, honest concern about, about genocides or war crimes going on in the other side of the world? And yeah, how, how does that work for you as an organization? Hamushim um, is interesting as a project for the Coalition of Women for Peace because it actually speaks to large group within the Israeli society. One of, this, uh, of the people who are working on revealing and exposing the Israeli export to human rights violating countries and conflict zone is called Itai Mack, and he's a lawyer that we work with a lot of the time, and he's going to court asking for the, the state to reveal what he has done uh, in terms of selling arms um, to send arms to Argentina, to Bosnia, to South Africa and apartheid, um, to Sri Lanka right now, to South Sudan. And the Israeli media grabs on it. Of course, the government does not reveal most of the information. Um, but people actually respond to it because in a certain way, speaking about selling arms to fuel genocide speaks to a lot of Israelis, even from the, from the right wing. Um, some of the main actors uh, working to expose the experts are, for example, the community of the Argentinian exiles, that while Israel was selling arms who killed Jews in mass proportions to their like, percentage of the population in, during the junta years, uh, many of them found refuge in Israel, and now they're trying to find out what happened to their relative. Was Israel involved in selling weapons and selling technologies and train and do a lot of training uh, with the dictatorship 
uh, while still find, giving them a political refuge. And there are other, there's a, a bill that was supposed to come up for now, and I think uh, it will, I don't know if it will pass, but it's a really nice collaboration between a, a member of Knesset, Amal Zangberg, who is from the left party Meretz, and Yehuda Glick, who is from the Likud party and is a religious, um, very right-wing and very liberal politician, and they're collaborating on the on the idea that every arms deal should be examined on the perspective of human rights. And a lot of members of parliament signed off on this deal from all parts of the political spectrum. And it's interesting, but when speaking about this, the issues of exports, it's the, easy, it's the topic that's easier for Israelis to really they, they just when and really speak about. When we speak about the occupation, we get cold. Nobody likes to make the connection between why our, the Israeli military industries are so professional and are so profitable to the exports to genocide, because nobody likes genocide. Um, so it's been tough, uh, but so far we're trying to make the connections and we work with broad coalitions uh, within the Israeli society and hopefully we'll manage to do that soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're going to go have a lot of questions later, but first... Uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess there's a... As one of the main experts in Germany, or one of the main speakers in Germany about the weapon industry, uh, we also had a little bit of discussion before about the how much does the weapon industry actually uh, affects the political decisions made about it, and how much of these just political decisions that are made uh, I would say, uh, for political reasons, without the effects of the industry, and how much does the industry actually has a role with it? Uh, maybe you can enlighten us a little bit about that that point. That is very interesting. Yeah, I mean, as a lefty, you always talk about the military-industry complex, mm -hmm. and then you think about 1910 or 1930, where basically the steel barons and, and the big um, arms companies in Germany, they more or less dictated German policy. I think today we have a different situation. Um, I think the influence of the German arms manufacturers on arms exports is limited. I come back to that later. I think that their biggest influence is on the procurement of the German army. And um, there's abundant examples how, I mean, there's, there's former um, staff members of the arms manufacturers, now members of parliaments, um, all members of parliaments that get money from, from the arms manufacturers. And there's two or three very interesting examples how they were able to influence the procurement decisions of the German army. So that works for them. Um, I had one example just to show how it works. I mean, there was uh, four years ago, there was an investigative committee, Untersuchungsausschuss um, in the German Bundestag uh, concerning the Eurohawk, a UAV, a drone um, that uh, just for, 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 not an armed drone, just for um, surveillance purposes. So they costed about 800 million euro and then it was just stopped in the midst of it. So 800, euro, 800 million euro wasted. So there was this investigative committee and one member of this committee from the CDU, he was also on the board of one company that earned a lot of money in the UAV project. So this seems like the industry controlling themselves and he having access to all the secret documents in, in the investigative committee, at least in theory, the industry would have had access to it. So this is how it works in Germany. Um, but um, the old lefty picture of the military industry complex um, really steering the foreign policy of this government and the arms exports, I think we are in different times now. The, the arms industry in Germany is rather small. I think if we talk about industry that's really having a big influence of, of the policy here, then we are talking about Volkswagen, Mercedes, about Deutsche Bank. I mean, it's, it's not the arms manufacturers. They are really small. Just to give you one number, only 0.1% of all German exports is arms exports. So 99.9% .9 of all exports is non-arms exports. So it's not a big value, so it's, it's not that big an issue, and the companies are not that big in Germany, so the influence, I would say, is rather limited on the exports. So that's a, that's a very good point, and the, rise the question, 
why are we, uh, I would say, in general, it's uh, like there's a feeling of almost ineffectiveness from the anti-militaristic movement here to, uh, to stop shipment of, of war. What, what is the motive there? Is it, uh, would you consider it as a purely political? I mean, that was the first question I asked Shachav. So why, why are the Israelis doing it? <laughs> because in Germany, I mean, as a lefty, you always think in economic terms. And you, the, the first word you always hear is the Rüstungslobby, you know, the, the lobbying of the arms industry. And yes, this is one part. Sometimes it's about money. If a German tank manufacturer wants to sell 270 tanks to Saudi Arabia, we are talking about billions. And these billions weigh a lot even in Berlin. So, I mean, there's at that point that would have some influence. Um, but... Many of these deals, I mean, you look at it, uh, 10 years ago, the, the, the Germans sold um, 600 um, assault rifles, G36, to Egypt. We're talking about less than 1 million euro here, you know, and, and it, it's really politically a very difficult thing to Mubarak at that time, you know. Everybody knew, and you could use these assault rifles to oppress your own population. So there was even one guy from the CDU in, in, in the committee, in the foreign committee, who asked, why the heck did you do this? I mean, everybody knew what Mubarak was doing, and the answer was, yes, it was in the war on terror. So, um, so sometimes it's not about money but it's about um, using arms exports as a means of foreign policy. There's a country you want to have very good relationship to, and if part of this good relationship is selling arms to them, they do it. This, I think, is one of the key reasons why even the Green Party is not for foreign arms export prohibition. They want to become foreign minister again, and the foreign minister wants to use this tool as a foreign minister to establish good relations to one country or the other. So I would think, I mean, sometimes you have both reasons, the economic ones and the foreign policy ones, but often it's really just about foreign policy. And how does it look from your side, or the idea of speaking about human rights violation, how effective is this discourse? Because I would say that usually the... When asking the German population with with, uh, with uh, Umfragen, uh, with uh, polls, usually there's a clear uh, clear opposition to selling arms to conflict regions, and still we are stuck in a place. Now it's like uh, it's other than the left party, it's it's almost a uh, it's not an accepted demand in the German. It's it's not something that the German Parliament can actually. No, I mean, it's very clear. In, in all the polls we had in the last five years, 80% and more of the people are against any kind of arms exports, not only to conflict regions or whatever. But human rights, I tell you what, I'm now for eight years in parliament and, and I can't hear the word human rights anymore. I mean, all these, you know, from Chancellor Merkel to all these ministers and every, every speech they give in parliament, human rights up and down a hundred times, but in the actual policy decisions they do, human rights don't count anything, nothing. It's, it's really so disgusting to see sometimes that it's, it doesn't play any role in their actual decisions. I mean, right now, for example, the Flüchtlingsfrage, you know, the, the, the refugee question. Uh, for the past one and a half years, every single decision on deployment of the German army to foreign countries, on any kind of foreign policy, the key point here is the, the refugee question. How can we stop the refugees, not only in, in, the, in the North African countries, but maybe even in Sudan already? So Bashar, uh, no, no, yeah, in, in, what's his name, Bashir, in, in Sudan. Mm -hmm. you know? He was the no-go person for a couple of years. You know? he, he sought with, a, with an international, by the International Criminal Court. So nobody in Germany would even touch anybody near uh, Bashir. Right now, they are talking to him, they are even training his um, 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 border troops just to keep the, the refugees away. So there's nothing about human rights, you know. If it suits him, if they think they need uh, to keep the refugees away for, for the election we have in this September, they, they deal even with the, with the worst human rights violators. Mm -hmm. So yes, in the German rules about the criteria on arms exports, you read a lot about human rights, but at, at the end of the day, they don't count nothing. Because it's not a clear rule. They don't say, you are not allowed to export to human rights violators. The rules say, human rights have to be taken into consideration. As many other points too, and at the end of the day, the human rights always loses. Okay, that's... Um, speaking again about the refugees and also the, the, whole, uh, the whole system that is created to uh, make it impossible for refugees to get here, how much is weapons actually being used then there as, as showing 
love to these countries, of, of uh, improving their relationship with countries uh, that are on the route of refugees? I mean, we have Algeria. They are right now getting a lot of a lot of weapons from Germany. Um, with Tunisia, I don't know the numbers, but I know that there's a lot of cooperation on border control, fences, or coast guards, whatever. So yes, so some of these exports um, are really linked to it. Um, I don't think they would really sell actual or, or donate or whatever give uh, actual weapons, arms to to Sudan. But what we hear, but it's not confirmed yet, is that at least they give some vehicles for the border troops, whatever. Cool. And maybe another point that was also in your in discussion with you is the idea of um, the military industry as not just being weapons, but a lot of time technologies. And how much is that actually in your work, is a part of your work, and how much do you think it's the parliament or people actually see it as kind of weapons? Surveillance programs and other means of, of uh, uh, control. I mean, that's very simple in, in Germany. We have um, the export control is about arms and armaments. In German, it's Kriegswaffen und andere Rüstungsgüter. So armament is everything that's used by the army, but is not a weapon in itself, like, you know, night vision goggles or the uniforms or software or whatever. So everything that cannot shoot itself, mm -hmm. but is part of military equipment. And, and the definition in the German law is very straightforward. If it's specifically designed for military use, then it's controlled. So many of these surveillance things fall under this rule. But for example, not these um, um, hacking devices, for example. There's at least one German company, FinFisher in Bavaria, that developed uh, um, software that allow a government to control all the commu co mobile communication of the population. And this is not specifically designed for military use, so there was no control over it until a few years ago. So we don't have numbers and anything. There was no regulation, so, so no licenses. It was just sold as a free thing. I think, I think that changed now, but I'm not very sure about it. And maybe the last, because speaking, first of all, this idea of, of weapons as part of foreign policy, which is very much, I would say, also a part of the German-Israeli relationship, uh, because there's a lot of talk about the German-Israeli friendship. Uh, a big part of it, especially for the Israeli Government is is actually the weapons uh, that are being brought uh, in in Rabat in uh, a little bit of sale, um, and how much does the how much is Germany uh, working actually to prevent other countries of using their like uh, of exporting weapons to other places? Is that even a, a subject that people talk about things that are being manufactured in Germany uh, and might and are exported to one country and what will happen with them next? Uh, I mean, there's, on paper, there's a very clear rule. Um, a license for an arms export is granted only if there's an end Verbleibserklärung. That means an end user agreement. So the, the country that is buying the weapons must sign that these weapons will stay in their country. And if not, they need a, an additional license from the German government. That's on paper. Um, but it's not controlled. I mean, for example, we found uh, some boxes, not we, but we saw them on pictures, and we had a journalist on the ground. Um, there, we found some boxes of G36 assault rifles in Libya, in Tripolis, in the palace of Gaddafi. There was never an export license for, for G36 to, to, to uh, Libya, never. So we tried to find out uh, which way it took, and uh, after a while, I think it's very clear now, it's not 100% proven, but 95% proven, these were the 600 rifles that were sent to Egypt, and then they were funneled to Libya. Um, but do you think that anyone in the German government had an interest to uncover the way, how it got there? I mean, I found a, a Milan rocket in, in Syria used by the Islamic State, you know. We found a G36 in Georgia. There was never a license for this. And, and the German government does everything not to investigate this. Because at the end of the day, they would find out that one of their partners with bad doers, and they don't want to, you know, <laughs> uncover that the U.S. or the French or whoever, you know, funneled some of the weapons to another place. So there's no interest in the government. So yes, on paper there's a clear rule, but nobody's enforcing it. But maybe the last question in that regard is uh, the idea of nuclear weapons, or uh, and this is very much also the German-Israeli connection. So there's submarines that are as 
as in Israel you always have to say before you say it, uh, supposedly uh, international media says that Israel has uh, uh, atomic weapons. Uh, you cannot say that in, in Israel uh, because of censorship. Uh, but the submarines are probably equipped and submarines are uh, probably equipped for it or are being made possible for it in Germany. And what kind of uh, regulations are, do you think, broken there or, or just not respected or is that uh, willingly ignorant? It's neither ignored nor is, was any law broken because I mean, there's no rule in Germany that prevents the German government to license a submarine for, for Israel that is designed to be used with nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And it's, everybody knows this. It's not like, yeah, it could be, but I've been in a discussion where people who were there at the time of the decision saying, we all knew at that time that these, it, it's about the torpedo tubes that have a bigger diameter. And everybody knew that this was only needed for the nuclear weapons. So everybody in the German government was aware of this. And they took this decision knowing what it's for. But there's no rule or law against it because they did not sell pieces or parts for a nuclear weapon. They just sold a submarine or, yeah, sold a submarine that is mm -hmm. possible to live in. So. Okay. Oh, thank you uh, so much. I guess, uh, is there any other point that you want to raise right now? Or, or you don't want to hear, hear it? It yeah, would yeah, be like yeah. 24 hours yeah. non-stop talking. It's okay, I have, I have a watch here. No worries. Um, so we can open the discussion already now, I guess. I, if you have some question, I would like to give you the first right to ask a question if you have for Jan. Or, uh, or if you have for... Yeah. I, I have a question. Yeah. What about transparency? You said there's hardly any information from the Israeli government on arms exports because we have since the red-green government since 99, we have an annual arms exports report from the government. Do you have anything like that? Not at all. And in fact, the state is refusing to give out information uh, that the lawyer Itaimak is going to court asking them to reveal the deals and the amount of contract that involves arms and technology and training, but still the state is refusing to really give out information because they feel not only it will hurt the security of Israel, it will, hope it will hurt the foreign affairs. So before the issue went to court, the government was willing to admit that Israel sells weapons to six countries. Uh, but after the court hearing, we actually learned it's 130 countries. And a lot of the, re the research is done by international partners who keep track of what goes where. And even though the state denies, there are a lot of testimonies that we try to make accessible to the, uh, to the public. But if it was up to the government, there was no transparency at all. The number, um, the number 130 countries is quite interesting because Israel has less diplomatic relationships with, uh, Israel has diplomatic relationship with less than 130 countries. I think Israel has diplomatic relationship with 110, I would say. I'm not sure exactly about the number, but there's clearly countries that uh, Israel is not officially speaking with, which is being, they are being, uh, Israel, is uh, Israel is being boycotted by them officially. Uh, there's no diplomat diplomatic relation and still weapons are being sold. And this is, I guess, a, one of the reasons also when they say for foreign affair reasons it's impossible. I guess that's uh, just to explain a little bit that point. Yeah. So, uh, I would uh, like to see if there's any questions from the crowd, if anyone wants to say something to ask about this subject. If not, I, I do have a little bit more questions, but... Uh, First of all, we want to open it for the for a small group so we can. Uh, can I just uh, yeah. the microphone? Uh, is that okay? With the microphone. With microphone is better? So I'll be here too. Hi, I'm Felix Pahl. Um, I have a question for you, Shachaf. Um, you mentioned just in passing your um, concepts of, of civil and feminist. Uh, concepts of security and that you present them at events. I'd uh, like to know more about that, both about the concepts and also on how the reactions are, what uh, feedback you get in Israel, what you, yeah. Basically because the, both the IDF and the Ministry of Defense and most of the military industries are run by men and white men, 
having a discussion about it when women actually do the speaking and the activism and the research is quite revolutionary <laughs> and in Israel. It, it, something that every time there is an operation or a war in Gaza, you can see all the people giving commentary on the news are all men without any exception. And it's part of the larger issues of militarism within Israeli society, but you, you have a voice if you're a high-ranking IDF official, which are usually white men. And given the, the right to speak uh, to women and giving them the opportunity to present their views on security is something that we try to do. And this is why we're mostly women activists, and this is why it's part of our f feminist perspective. Uh, of security, working in the Coalition of Women for Peace, because women do not get the say in most issues of security. And not only do women don't get the say, civilians hardly get the say. Well, there's no actual differentiation between who's a soldier and who's not, but we know for sure that minorities are less likely to be soldiers or in, working in the military industries. And specifically Palestinians who live within, within Israel suffer the consequences of the military industries and the militarization of society because they face uh, racial profiling and securitization processes within Israel and within the uh, Palestinian cities and towns and just walking wild Arab is, <laughs> is, a, is a problem. And giving them uh, the opportunity to speak about their experiences regarding securitization and regarding uh, the mass distribution of firearms is what we try to do, and we try to shift the focus from military speak of security to civil one, to speak about the, with the people who are hurt by the weapons. Um, in Israel, in the occupied territories, in Gaza, and of course abroad, where Israeli arms get to. So, are there any more questions? Not I had a little few more, but yeah. Okay, um, my question is, what is known in Israel about the German-Israel uh, cooperation in development of uh, special arms technology, for instance? And to Jan, uh, is that of any significant sig significance? You're asking about uh, joint development. I mean, the only thing I really know of is the UAV, UAV the drone. The, the, I think right now the, the German army leases uh, Israeli UAVs. Um, whether there's even a part of joint development, I'm not sure of. And let me think. but. I, I never came across a joint weapons development between the Israelis and the Germans. I mean, if you say, for example, the submarines, or right now the corvettes, there's always parts of it are produced in Israel. So this is sort of a technological cooperation, but it's different from a specific research and development program for specific uh, special weapons. I'm not aware of that. Me neither, uh, but I'll say that a big part of the collaboration revolves around training. Um, law enforcement in, uh, for German come to Israel to train about anti-terror tactics, because Israel really marketed itself as the Harvard of anti-terrorism, facing a lot of terror attacks. And so a lot of different groups of law enforcement from all over the world come and train in Israel to see how it's done, and also the German um, delegations come. Unfortunately, we don't have specific numbers because there's no transparency on anything, but there were a lot of testimonies regarding German groups. If you want these numbers, ask me, because we can ask these numbers to the German government and they will give it to us. <laughs> so the numbers of Germans being trained there and the other way around, the number of Israelis coming here, we get all these numbers. So just ask me and then we do it. Uh, well, I 
uh, really come from Lake Constance, you know, one of the most beautiful areas in, in Germany. And around Lake Constance, there are many, many villages, or there are many villages where military equipment is produced or special technology. You know, it's not big things, but it's small things that is needed for kind of arms or rockets or uh, you name it. And I have uh, learned that there is significant uh, Israeli investment into these German companies. Maybe that needs to be put into public. I don't read much about it, apart from the area where I'm living there. This is really interesting. I never heard about this. But on the other hand, we know, for example, that um, an Arab uh, country or company bought part of the military shipyard in, in northern Germany. So with, that is now producing ships for Israel, by the way. I mean, so it's sort of a, a very complicated thing. But I never heard about Israeli investments in, 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 in the Bodensee industry. Yeah. What I know right now is that for the past um, decade or so, France was the European cent like home base for Israeli companies. And at the moment, from what I understand, they're trying to move all their operations to Germany. Uh, a few companies opened or are opening offices. And actually, from what I understand, almost 35% of Germany's import of arms is Israeli. So I'm sure it involves those uh, specific issues, but I, I don't know. Uh, you mean representatives, no? Like when they, uh, you mean like they open an office? Like as a as a address to have in some country to sell, that's what it, uh, you know, when they open the office in France or from moving it from France to Germany, you mean like just the official address where they uh, they actually register the company in Europe, to have a registration in Europe for a company, right? Or, I'm or, not or sure. okay, yeah, you, 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 okay. But, um, I'm not sure if it's specifically the. Hmm? Hi, sorry. I'm not sure if it's specifically for official reasons to move the address, but they have representatives working from here as a base um, to work better with the German market and to be available on all times. Yeah, I wanted to underline what you said that, uh, of course, there is a very uh, close cooperation between Israel and Germany. For example, in the question of drones, uh, I'm part of the BDS campaign and we um, spoke about this and published about this, like I think, I'm very forgetful about years, but six years ago or something, and uh, that uh, the Bundeswehr would train, the German army, army would go for trainings uh, together with Israel and in Israel about drones and other techniques of counterinsurgents, which later on uh, have been applied in Afghanistan. Um, I think this is a very, very important and close cooperation, which has not yet been focused on here in Germany. Uh, in general, I find it more interesting to speak about these links and these cooperations, which are also military diplomatic deals, you know, for, for supporting Israel in this thing, um, Germany gets diplomatic uh, support and vice versa. Um, and this cooperation, this very close co cooperation goes back to the very beginning of, uh, well, Germany and Israel were parallel, <laughs> came into being, so to speak. Um, and uh, there is a very good article, by the way, uh, by Ottfried Nassauer about this, uh, these links and this cooperation. And yeah, I'm very glad that today um, uh, you, you, you gave your talk here, but I think we could still go much deeper into, the, into these links. As you said, uh, 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 weapons export is not the important, is very important in, in the Israeli case, but I think much more internationally um, is the role, Israel's role um, in, in, um, in providing for counterinsurgents, technologies, ideas, etc. And that's a much more complex uh, field than just weapons. 
maybe take in your remark that was not a question and make maybe a question that is a bit more, uh, as people who are active against the weapon industry, uh, we can usually uh, try to uh, cry how, how inhumane it is the, uh, to, to say it's, it's against human rights. Uh, it's a lot of times, although and you can see it with, with German uh, arms uh, around the world and also with Israeli arms around the world, it also uh, doesn't lead to more security. Uh, for a lot of populations, and I don't know how much anti-militaristic argumentation, if if you think after eight years of doing what you're doing in in parliament, and and I guess stuck in your head a lot of times, it, like uh, in in walls, because because the, the, just to speak about human rights, as you say, doesn't work so well. Uh, what do you think anti-militarist activists put their argumentation on? Where 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 should we? How can we stop it then? If not. I mean, this is an easy case because, as I said, 80% of the population are against any kind of arms exports. So you don't have to argue, you don't have to convince. You just have to find a campaign to win it. And, I mean, I'm a trained Greenpeace campaigner and I think there's no way of, of attacking the arms industry because that's their job to sell weapons. Um, but we are in the lucky situation that they need licenses. So I think this in Germany, the, the strategic way right now is not convincing the population or attacking the industry, but um, trying to get the right decision in the parliament. Because the government licenses these exports. And I think we were pretty successful. I mean, there's a huge debate in Germany about it now. When I started 2009, there was nothing. It was in 2010 that the Aktion Aufschrei, that a huge number of, of NGOs in Germany, developmental NGOs, church groups and everything, started their campaign. And it's all over Germany in small cities and villages and whatever, they did actions. I think together with our work in Parliament, we were able to bring it really to the forefront and. I mean, right now, I would think there's a huge majority in the German parliament to stop arms exports. <laughs> um, but, um, and, and, and this is probably one of the reasons, if not the only reason, why um, within the Social Democrats, uh, the former minister who was responsible, Gabriel, really took a stance, a public stance against arms exports. Then he granted much more than anyone before him. But, I mean, there was at least public talk against it. And, and I think there's, there's a huge, vast majority within the Social Democratic uh, parliamentary group against it. So I think the pressure is there, and it just has to turn into a decision in Parliament. And I'm, I'm very confident that in the next couple of years, regardless of the government we will get this September, um, there will be a decision at least to stop any kind of small arms exports. They are the most deadliest weapon, and there's not a single justification for that. I mean, selling 600 rifles to Mubarak, I mean, nobody can justify it even you know, if, if they talk for 10 hours. Everybody knows that it's wrong, you know? So I think that, that's the simple one, but we still have to win it. Um, maybe if you want to say something about your, your, pers just, uh, the, your perspective of, uh, of what kind of campaigns you're, you're hoping to achieve, something, like how do, you, how do you do achieve to like, change something actually in the Israeli politics, not just as a lefty activist that will say what's right, but how to... Uh, how to lead campaigns right now, which is important for you? Right now we're trying to start public discussion. There's really nothing that goes on who criticizes the full length of the military industries. And we do support the bill of Tamal Zangberg and Yehuda Glick to have arms exports being um, supervised by human rights uh, perspective and hopefully they'll be able to achieve it and then we'll have a start of actually speaking about those issues as a violation of the law. And I think that the biggest struggle at the moment is at all speaking about the occupation. Speaking about the Israeli military industries in the perspective of export, it's easy, like it speaks to people, but speaking about the occupation and finding the occupation which is eventually our end goal it will take a lot of work and have, having a campaign uh, that will mobilize the Israeli society or, and the Israel and the Palestinian society within 48 against those who profit from the occupation is something that first had to be talked about and this is what we're trying to do. And internationally, the B BDS groups all over the world and specifically in Europe are working on the issues against the Israeli military industries. They've been targeting companies and they've been targeting university who works with specific companies 
And that's another international angle to even beginning a discussion about it because of the, what's going on and there are really successful actions and people are blocking entrances uh, to Elbit um, factories in the UK. The discussion does not get to the Israeli society. They don't know that it's going on, except the people who work for the company. It's really silence. So I think that transcending that message is also going to be a big part say, to having people actually see that those, those companies that we all have, a brother or an uncle or somebody that we know who works for those companies, that they're actually not that, they don't make us more secure. I'll put it that way. Is there anyone else who want to ask? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. uh, one last question. After the visit of our foreign minister, Gabriel, to Tel Aviv, uh, after he came back, I suggested to him that he would deliver the next submarine himself to Israel. Now, uh, to be seriously, what do you actually expect from us in terms of delivering the delivery of submarines to Israel? What do you expect from the party of the left? Um, the end goal would be for me to have a military embargo on Israel until there is an actual like progress in peace talks. That would be the end goal for me and for a lot of the Palestinians who are now working uh, to realize that as a campaign goal. Um, right now, I would expect you guys to raise hell about the submarines and to make to raise hell to make a public discussion about it and to really put pressure on the investigations that are going on in Israel and to make it a diplomatic matter um, within the whole concept of resisting the arms industry. Um, I would also want to have activism within Germany fighting against the occupation. I mean, it's really hard, as I understood in the last, in the last <laughs> couple of days, it's really hard to discuss about issues that revolving the occupation and even referring to what Israel is doing as an occupation. Um, but it would, I think that there is work to be done within the left to even begin a discussion about those issues, to make it possible to speak about military embargo and to speak about who's profiting from the occupation. Okay. So, as we promised, the discussion today was uh, more or less short. If there's no more questions, of course, we would be very happy. Uh, Jan, would you like to have to say some last words or? Uh... Say my last words. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm out of parliament in a few weeks, so yeah, yes, it's my last words. Um, it was interesting when I listened to you in, in, in your first talk, and I thought, wow, horrible, wow, horrible. And then I realized it's exactly the same here. I mean, there's minor differences, and I think the biggest difference is on scale. But we have fairs at universities where are the arms manufacturers on exhibition. Um, we have people from the Bundeswehr, from the German army, going directly to arms manufacturers. We have ministers going directly to arms manufacturers. We have people from arms manufacturers sitting now in the Bundestag, in the parliament. So, I mean, we, we have the revolving doors in all three directions. Um, we have research, military research at universities. The scale is probably different. And the one course you're mentioning, a course at a German university, on teaching how to better sell arms, we won't have that. <laughs> um, and we are better on transparency. But all the rest you're saying, it's the human rights, yes, there's the word in there, but the rule is so weak that it's legally, it's allowed in Germany to sell any kind of weapon to any kind of country. And when you mentioned South Sudan, I said, yes, they won't do this. But then f even in Israel, that would be illegal, so it would be undercover. So I think the difference is the scale. You said six billion um, arms exports a year. We have eight billion under Merkel. But this country is much bigger. So in relationship, um, um, the scale is different in your country. But at the end of the day, and we have a whole institution, the Bundesausfuhramt, you know, probably hundreds of people working there on not controlling. They say they are controlling arms exports. I say they are sort of um, registering it, whatever. But we have every year applications for around 15,000 licenses, and 100 are denied. 
So it's, it's, you know, everything goes through. So I think the difference is on scale and maybe some things that are too far off what you're doing, at what Israel is doing, we don't have. But the difference is probably the same in every country. They sell everything wherever they, they can get a buyer. Okay, that's a very optimistic last uh, word. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming here. I know it's hot and it's so much nicer outside right now. And uh, have a nice evening. Yeah, and of course, thank you so much for both of our sisters.